Nara ia swa Nara ia swa Nara Nara ia swa Nara ia swa Nara The city is burning down Ia swa Nara The city is burning down. When the men were burning, their wives' mouths became wood fire. Their huts, a growing dry forest ready to burn beyond recognition. The soil and our accomplice who had too much to drink with petrol the night before. Rebonds are for those ready to breathe again. But we are dead here, in the hands of a lover. Patriarchy has cleansed its fists, disguised as an intruder in toilet seats. Patriarchy has turned a teller at the post office. We have been burning here. Our third degree burns recite their names as mantras. We are dead here. But when the men were burning, their wives mouth breathed, Khaleesi's dragons breathed out fire, burning their temples beyond recognition. We have been burning here. But autopsy found that these men have been breathing chlorine trioxide. Autopsy must be wrong. How can a soccer ball do so much harm protested their wives? We are dead here. We have banned here. We have banned from both ends. Our hearts Bend from both ends, a cremation of love everlasting, re as love always. But in this village, love comes wrapped in blankets, warming caskets. We are dead here. We have been dead here. Welcome to bodies under siege. And what we have accustomed to is to peep through the window as we listen to the screams and shouting of women's skins bashing the iron in the hands of our lovers. We are dead. We are burned. Should we wait? But fossil soul, the stage is yours. How do we account for our brethren that act as agents for incest when our very own siblings, both male and female, took turns with us for their sexual explorations? 
Ngipalela wena mlando weka zilami. How do we account for our kinship that molests us through coercion to make us believe that we want it in order to appease our brother's curiosities? Of seeing a fully fledged, sexually competent woman in the 14 year old girl that we were, oblivious of their being 16 years our senior. How do we account for our brothers who are pedophiles? How do we account for our brothers who are rapists? When my uncle did the same to my mother, my brother did the same to my sister, and I survived it by squealing about a forced hand job. Ginyang eganchani in Javini Yasekaya a young shipiza yang nyugubeza yang shugumeza Josilam Ageko no munye we zinganezenu of Nuxambulul Igama Loguba umdeni alisafigelindawo Igama Loguba umdeni alisafigelindawo Igama Loguba umdeni alisafigelindawo was crowned with the very last place in your life. I knew it because your fist had stamped me of approval. All over my ribcage, your Bureau of Standards found home. I suppose you needed to know if I could stand all the faces of your being and my abhorrence of your drinking was one of the ways you felt I never loved you enough. A girl-on-girl girl love that was tougher on me than loving any man had ever been. That night, you drank, and you too stepped your way into the trenches of my psyche. You found ways of making me question the tenacity of your claims of ever loving me. Yet, watching you writhe from being so broken by life, I would rather have died than to have walked away without bringing you some light. That night, you drank and you forced me into a threesome between the walls and the clenching of your fists. Somehow, the skins of your fingertips braised my skin with a grip so deep that my arm's length of self-defense made you pummel on me even harder. I remember repeatedly asking myself how I was even entertaining this. And every time I tried to walk away, your upheaval towards my fearlessness would pull me back and smack me, yet again against another wall. Walls I had to continue finding life in as I cooked soulful meals in your aunt's kitchen because you drank away our opportunities to independence. And yet again, my abhorrence of your drinking was one of the ways you felt that I never loved you enough. So bashing me against walls and pinning me to bricks with your fists was your way of asserting that you would always choose the bottom of green bottles over making the world green with envy about a love I believed you deserved. Now, every time I look at our portraits, I remember how to you, my tears turned to Amstel lagers. I remember how you had almost left my soul charred 
from inhaling the fumes of a calling flag label and how for another year you continued to violate my psyche with statements of me bitching you back to the bottle. Violate my heart as my tears fell on your deaf ears. Violate my elders as I tirelessly had to beg my ancestors to forgive you even though you knew exactly what you were doing. Until the day you told me that I had become your outlet for 24 years of your pent-up anger because you couldn't handle the truth. Confronting your demons sprung a war on me that you should have directed towards your inner child wounds. I suppose I should take comfort in that you saw that far into the light. Sikulegu chalwa abafana uguti ntombazana ishaiwa. Ageko waschelu guti siyo tandana na mantombazane na wo ashayelu kutandabuza izi mozabo zoguba izi dawa. Angmangali. Sikulaschelu guti uma intombazane iksugela na wo intombazane itumele. Never have my tears meant less in my life than the love that you believed I deserved. Stamped yours. Your violated ex. The survivor. For the mothers of lost souls, mothers who lost their brethren to distasteful hatred and the lingering stench of its loyalty to loss. For the mothers of sons and daughters betrayed by our lack of commitment to love via moral law that holds no shame when death creeps through its fingers to stop an innocent child from living their life as all they really know it to be. For the mothers of hate crime victims, bestowed with the heavy burden of standing front and center of this defense of my child war, which forces her to kiss away the achievement of her endless hours of labor. No more graduations to celebrate. No first car to celebrate. No new house to denote adulthood. Not even a new pair of shoes saying her fledgling can fly. Oh, what a friend we have in grievance. No more birthdays to celebrate. Not a grandchild in sight. No debts from building the family home. Not even failed report cards begging for another chance. Oh, what a friend we have in grievance. 
for the mothers who have been robbed by the systematic outcry of injustice, announcing its once again obliviousness to freedom of expression, followed by its murky council of bloodthirsty vultures who saw over the nation, hunting for none but nonconformity. This one is for our mothers whose eyes bleed at the sight of their children found screwed across deserted fields with toilet plungers and broken glass bottles shoved up their vaginas, tearing up their anuses and their eyes gouged out of their sockets by perpetrators with no courage to stare fear in the face. This is for the mothers who meditate upon the stench of their children's bodies. Caskets have become the space between the bed and the floor, and a dignified funeral now means being shoved in a trash can to rot in an alley. As naked as the day I was born, now we stand here as naked as the day our children were raped. Oh, what a friend we have in grievance. This is for the mothers who never got to defend their child's honor because homophobic misogynists want to tell us how to enjoy our sexuality. This is for the mothers who stand strong every day, reminiscing on the day we were born because no child goes unnoticed and death has become our daily bread. Women, children, and nonconformists reek of unbroken chains of slavery. Existence is granted in sovereignty to those with denigrating authorities, power that seeks to destroy in order to maintain its stature. Intergenerational curses and the irreparable damage of cycles of traumas from being the sacrifice will continue to run rampage until you heal. When will you allow us to heal? Our invisibility in our communities is the manifestation of the woozing stench of our blood becoming the potion that binds the perpetrator's supremacy. The cries for cleansing and renewal of the forces of life within us are now louder than the gongs of protest that we need to reiterate every three hours as the bodies of women, children, and other beings become latrines for misused power purging its own self-hatred. Our blood 
will never cleanse you of the warfare from the festering wounds ruminating inside of you. Your lack of acknowledgement for your need to heal the generational sufferings and the delinquencies of your predecessors is what will continue the cycle of your kin finding influences as demolition forces because their spirits long to be cleansed of misinformation and their souls long to be free from defamation. Allow them to build immunity towards dark forces that master them with puppetry for disparaging agendas. Every intangible wound manifests as the root cause of its onset. The saying goes, if a child feels unwelcome in their village, they will burn it down to feel its warmth. Damage will continue to mutilate until it is tended to. Their hearts want to be freed from being whirlwinds of disaster. When will you allow your bloodlines to heal? Break the cycle. Creation was only ever perceived at the moment of your conception. Isanja Sankulunguru Sasi Kakasela, Ebenda Iskumba Sako, Engabaza Ubu Shebenda Loyake. In the many shades of black so striking, not even the night sky can attest to its beauty. My heart, the defeated Goliath, they say, sometimes love knocks you down. Your gaze has dismantled my stealth, saying, Yogu Kiela I go to Amdano Mundu. God constructed mountains out of the formations of your cheekbones. Wells on the furrows of your smile to encapsulate joy on the pores of your skin. Joy will tickle your core so deep that you will laugh at the audacities of life that ever made you question your existence. Your nose flares up with a pride so intelligent. Fraternizing with fantasies of touching your lips keys me into the gateways of heaven. Umsoko o bojangenzi yo upishi gangomlo mo wako uwechele gusle vusako because your jawline carries railways that make us question. Oh, which train our questions of your beauty, Jenga's card? Ushebendalo si basi kupela ngobuta. Giti mina tujun tombazane in the likeness to India Ari. You know I love your black skin. Upkosi ububamba gomkancho. Somnyama ngonyama. Hail the dark lioness. Zikenye ndombazane. Tushu.
young black lesbian. With time, your faces will change. With time, your swag will rearrange. With time, your faces will cut frames. And in a stint, you may look back and even consider yourself lame. In time, your life may be taken for granted and maybe even slain. But let not the perils of this world define you as pain. Dear young, melanin abundant, same sex loving woman, your fellow black woman asked of her message to you says, you grip the knife at the sharpest of edges. You may be grappling with definition because justice is for the conformist. It is transparently visible that you do not exist three times. You are black, visible only in relation to white. Woman, visible only in relation to man. Homosexual, visible only in relation to straight. And in protest, I declare that you are the romance to your own existence. The caress to your name, kissing the archives of times gone by. So wise up and read. Because the history books are how you have now become a legacy. Dear young black lesbian, with faces and phases anew, your life has officially been placed on a silver platter. Let not their misconceptions define you as pain. Let them make your fire burn brighter, for to the future generations you are a torchbearer. You are a peacekeeper. You are the bread to the builders who construct the bridging of gaps between us. You are a heavy-footed spirit. Because your purpose is the motive of greatness, and herein lies the existence of your life ever so blatant. Dearest, fresh, colorful, homosexual sister, you are the riches that will afford future generations an inheritance of social bonds that afford the comprehension of the freedom to choose. This year publication acknowledgement of the barriers that you have had to clap through while someone claimed to have recognized you. This publication is living proof that your existence supersedes the binaries of time. There is nothing left behind that cannot relate to you. Because if it is not documented, it means it never existed. This publication is living proof of your being that can never be wiped out by any kind of socio-historical amnesia. So, dear young black lesbian, continue to live. So Gozani, fossil soul on the mic. And when your ancestors cannot speak on your behalf, one is ought to cry. But my hands are knives. Be cautious. My hands are knives ready to castrate again. When a woman knows a kicking of a lover, kicking their belly with jewels of new life in their belly, all they have left is a baby blanket as a reminder that I too was supposed to be a mother. A reminder of a blanket put on display to show that I can also bear children. 
but this man know. They speak of our pain in Shabin's whiling away time. Soetry, the stage is yours. There is no wanderer like an autumn leaf on an open field. Free, light, and blown by instinct. It cringes into an open casket for the funeral of what is left of the rain. This leaf tussles through the floating, singing hymns of the stories of mothers who only knew how to live by leaving their husbands. Music always finds a congregation of leaves by the fence, waiting for the teeth of a rake and a burning. They still wonder though, heavier with barely any blood to call their own. They wonder with hands that suffocate their own. They wander with fragments of what remains of their soul. I'm a fist catching fire from my brother's breath. I'm smoke, a yet to be memorized poem burning. I am black and forgotten to be capable of ash. I'm the existence of an urn, a potter's dream beneath a mastered seed, a seed growing to be cut down for more paper. I'm a forest burning. I'm how to die and how to stay that I. I'm a violent folding inside a writer's fist. I'm written, but I'm no longer seen. I'm folding my brother in my left fist, suffocating my nephew in my right fist. I have fist, papers, and dishonest poems. I am an unread poem passing flames to little boys. I'm a son to a present father. I'm trash, folded with tough love. I'm burning on my sister's pubic hair. I am fire, burning a city. I am skin, covering blood. I'm skin, holding all of my family's rage. I am rage, mistaken for a penis. I am capable of loving. I am capable of being red. I am black and boy, hoping to stay alive. At least until my father opens me to read that there are more ways to being man than burning. I'm paper burning. I'm tears flowing to fists that the fire does not reach the written parts of me. I am paper turned into a lighter. I am paper turned into a lighter. I am paper turned into a lighter. Whirlwind walks towards Malapile's home's dusty yard and he watches from the mouth of his mother's kitchen ready to send it away. He's been taught how to point at the hearts of whirlwinds to signal that he is not welcome here. 
The whirlwind, then unclothes sand grains, whirs its dust as organs as it spin walks to the neighbors. The neighbors too chases the whirlwinds further from where could have been his home in the young storm, does the same with the neighbors' dust, collects. See, in this village, boys are told to go play with their neighbors. Malabila is told to play with Mashilo and his other friends. This would happen until they enough barefooted boys to carry dust from their homes into the yards and as they play, dust would grow as high as above their heads, dust on their skin, their hair turning brown, their broom-like feet, dusting off playgrounds, dust on their clothes and accompanying them to their mother's scolding, dust left hanging on air. See, this happened each and every time Malapila broke things at home. Grandmother's guest plates, her sauces, and more things made of bone ash. She broke them all before learning how to break other boys' bones. Now he is a whirlwind in his grandmother's house, wearing the village's dust and breaking into walls. It took me 24 years to know the identity of this dust. It is a lesson on how to break away from home, how to break the smaller boy away from his home, how Malapile breaks in tears until the dust in his eyes becomes mud, how mud holds in his crying, how mud builds a heart in his eyes, how the heart in his eyes whispers a warning, how the heart in his eyes is a symbol for his heart being away from home but closer to clenched fists, how nothing but anger grows in his eyes, how his eyes are open doors to staying at home, but he's always told to go outside to grow. This thus is Mashilu and Malapile envying the bigger boys. It is Mashilu and Malapile impatiently waiting for their turn to stop crying. This dust is a boy making his father's house dusty. How his father's belt is the only hand that cares to whip the dust off his skin. This dust is Mashilu, Muraka in a clean classroom, dusting each other's faces with fists, littering the classroom with blood. It is the class chairing the chairs, betting on who kept the other one clean, is keeping faces blue and fists red. This dust is every boy wanting to be dustier. It is violently breathing out until angry exhales, storms out like the whirlwinds we chase away from their homes. This dust. It's Mashilu, Malapile, Moraka being whirlwinds. It's their mothers pointing at kitchen doors to puke them out during the day that they learn how not to cry or cough in each other's presence. It is Malapile not returning home on some nights, forgetting how to look at his sister, choking his brother with just a look. It is every boy in this village who are winding away from his home, but all towards each other's homes. It is every house in this village facing a blind storm. And this, this here is a story of how it took a village to raise a storm. In this place, there is a house abandoned like black boys' bodies and emotions. Spine and ribs are pillars holding a body's heavy silence. Eyes are windows that forgot what rain feels like. This is a poem about men who left their bodies and a mother who tiptoes around their heart. In every house or mother, there is a wife or a mother searching for sons and a husband whose chest, how storms she cannot see through. This house is a battlefield 
where a heartbeat is a ticking time bomb with fists exploding into those who are close. But a mother or a wife always dances near her beloved's heart, her feet tread closer to death, or a crow's open mouth, or an open ditch that swallows bodies. On most days, walking in this house, in this body, is as suicidal as loving a black man. But how does she not love her own creation when carrying is a suicide note she writes too well. Her organs and blood write themselves on the walls of a son's heart. She knows the art of loving. She packs pieces of her breath in their deflated lungs. She gives everything, everything to the hands of love, including her obituary. Behind her son's eyes, a heavy storm. Beautiful things are locked inside them. Tears, love, a redefinition of what a spine is and reasons to stay at home and in their bodies. The dust in this house and this body is a library telling her of the man who left as burnt anthologies their skin holding death like a prayer that worship drunk and lost footsteps. Like a casket, a crow's mouth opens up to swallow her sons. Like a crow's feathers, her father's teeth flap death at the door of every ear, but she still searches, hands in kitchen, building a lifeboat she hopes they smell from afar. But their rage keeps a crow's mouth open the way a shovel keeps the earth open. They strangle themselves, choke on their loved ones, their ribs break at each other's touch. The walls inside them wear their tears, the way broken, blood-stained lips wear their silence. Men paint each other's lips with fists while teeth abandons their silent mouth. She touches the pain with the bandages she has, with the palms she has for bandages, keeping their blood on her hands because mothers know how to carry blood like a seed or a father's forgotten name, her hands letting go of places that don't need to be held. She notices how beautiful it is outside this body, retraces her lost footsteps and squeezes herself into throats that fall apart like rubble. Walking in this house, in this body, is that suicidal was loving a black man and looking down his throat to see that you are his silence, to see the inside of a coffin to see the silence in each one of us, to see death, to see hope in a crow's open mouth. I am a quarter of a century bleeding black boy stories. My stories are made out of fathers, sons, nephews, and brothers. Fathers who evict children away from their homes, sometimes their mother's breath out of her body. Sons who nurse their wounds with more blood. Nephews who learn that blood clots, bleeding stops, thinking it is okay to make others bleed. And brothers who carry their family's blood in their mouths, writing poems like mine. I overuse the word men in most of my poems. We men insist on being part of poems on violence. I repeat the word fathers in most of my poems. 
Fathers leave to live in poems about, he, about leaving. These poems became homes they know how to stay at. I repeat the content in my poems. Repetition is a way of me not being silent. Silence is healing. Healing is in existence. Life is looking at a wound and calling it a, poo, a, a poem or death. It is seeing a blood clot as a good poem, seeing blood as black as ink, bleedings for humans, my mouth is a wound. I'm a quarter of a century bleeding black boy stories. But I'm hoping and praying that one day 80% of the content in my poems become irrelevant. I want my children to ask me what I meant by a village raising a blood storm burning on my sister's pubic hair and other lines that has violence for a tongue. See, my poems are never meant to stay. They're meant to leave with the violence that wrote them. Even if I am that violence, especially if I am that violence. My poetry is me holding my breath that I do not get to choke on my uncle's spine. If I die from holding my breath, I will leave poems wishing no one else write these stories. But if I find my breath, I will write love poems, making my lover's secrets fornicate in public. Mm. Oh. O ramasedwa poloko ro tla o wena re kokobetsa re kwatami ka dikhuru re re le rena hore lwele ramasedwa poloko le rena re re ke rena ba gago ana wa ro bonana ana wa re kwana ramasedia poloko ra re le rena ke rena ba gago Oh, forgive us men for what we have wronged you. Retsuareleng. Si ashweleza. Si ashweleza. Si ashweleza. Vangile gancho. The stage is yours. Oh, my tongue. We are small girls, stitched with scars and love, draped into breaths of fabric, colored, patched, hemmed, clots of moments quilted into human. Mama, I am burning. I am burning, Mama. Mama, I am burning. In a box set on fire while I slept. I slept, Mama. A girl faced the bullets head on. She caught a bullet in her eye. She is blind. Mama, I am burning. 
mama. Something is wrong, mama. I kept pulling down my skirt, kept checking my lipstick. I was hiding in this box. They found me hiding, mama. The fire is an uncle you trusted, mama. And while you were gone, an uncle who promised to watch me while you were gone, and while you were gone, the fire burnt me, mama. While you were gone, while I was sleeping, I forgot to pull down my skirt. I put too much lipstick on. I'm burning, Mama. Mama, I'm burning. On the 14th and 15th of April, 2014, 269 girls were stolen from Chibok. 112 of those girls are still missing. This isn't just about those girls. Uyinene, Garabo, Humuzo, Tembani, Tandega, Yasmin, Sibanins. My darling, it has been 2,357 days since you were stolen from us. And I have wept for you incessantly since, every day. I know this letter will not reach you today or tomorrow even, but I pray in my heart that you will read it eventually. I have tried to write to you so many times, but what does one say to a stolen child? How do I comfort you or give you hope? How do I tell you that this will pass and you will survive? That you will come home and even there you will survive. I want to tell you that I would search those forests barefoot for as long as it takes if it would help find you because we are the same, you and I. I am older and we are separated by mountains and rivers and deserts even, but we are the same. We are two small girl pawns on different chessboards in the same tournament. Our lives are statements, objects. We exist to be taken from the grocery stores, from our schools, from our beds. Our bodies do not belong to us. The world remains silent for what must have been a lifetime when you were stolen. No one but Umama wept. And then there was noise, anger on airwaves, voices from every corner of the globe sent out virtual search parties. But we know the truth about this virtual world, me and you. We know that hashtags don't bring girls home. In my mind, there are no politics. I don't care about fundamentalists and terrorists and bureaucracy. Right now, I don't even care about the politics of silence. All I care about is you and having you home. This world doesn't know who you are. To them, you are described only as black and girl and gone. But I have known you my whole life. I have watched you dream. This is not how I wanted to find out how strong you are. Every day you stay alive is a miracle testimony of divinity. You are my hero, but I need you to be brought back home now. And when you are home, we will speak of this silence and that noise and this silence again. We will start conversations about guerrilla movements, liberation movements, rape camps. 
we will talk about education and politics and religion and how our bodies are constant battlefields when you are home. I am afraid of who you are now, who you have had to become to survive our public service announcements, our virtual search parties, everything has failed you. Umama waits for you every night. She still washes your uniform sometimes. She dishes up for you on other nights. Even now, after 2,357 days, everything is still waiting for you to be brought back home. We're not safe, you know, we're not safe. Small girl. Small girl with moths in her mouth. Speaks anger in glances, knows the dagger of words. Small girl, big voice, knows how earthquakes begin. In the rumbling of her stomach, entire families collapse. Small girl cares too much for such a small girl. Small girl with treacherous eyes Carries too much feeling in her lungs Knows the sting of lonely Small girl sees too much Breathes too much Takes up too much air Small girl is too much Mirror and expectation Too much wanting more Small girl should know better than to try to fight the sun. Small girl with hands of spades wants to plant and grow. Small girl dreams too much, hopes too much. Small girl thinks she is the ocean. Small girl is a stream. Small girl will break her heart with all this want. Small girl is not even the wind. Small girl must learn to swallow and be pretty. An old woman whispers into a small girl's navel then wraps her neck with red and white beads. The old woman smears calamine on the small girl's forehead. Under her left breast, between her shoulder blades. When the small girl wakes, her eyes are glued together with tears. She learns to see in the dark. She can smell the rain coming. She knows a storm is brewing. Tonight, there is no black. There is no dark, no light. Today, there are only blues and blood, hope, and heart. A half-done face in a coffin. A brewing storm of small girls coming. Two beautiful men push me onto a bed. One puts his knees on my wrists and covers my mouth. The other puts his knees on my ankles and unzips his pants. 
The man on my wrists shoves his tongue down my throat. The unzipped man pulls my panties down my legs. He is a tree stub inside me with roots tying my legs to the ground. It's his tongue inside my mouth now. Maybe I'm the ground and he isn't digging. Maybe he's pulling, trying to pull his roots out of me, pulling and pulling and pulling. Maybe he's stuck inside me. The man on my wrists has a gun to my head. He rubs it against my hair, grunting. He is now unzipped. The tree stub is on my wrists. All I feel is the first shot. Everything else is him moving and breathing and licking the tears down the side of my face. When I close my eyes, I look for God. Where is she? I tell her I'm sorry and I promise to be happier and to drink less and I won't talk to strangers no matter how good looking they are. And if she can't make them stop, I beg her to let me sleep. She doesn't let me sleep. I am the ground again. And I am shot. My grandmother was a teacher. My mother was a healer. My mother's younger sister was a Christian. My mother's other younger sister had a paralyzed daughter. All were wonderfully beautiful. When I was born, my grandmother sent a telegram with my name. She saw me in a dream, my grandmother saw herself reborn through my mother. When I left home after she died, my grandmother visited me in a dream. She painted three dots from blood onto my forehead. My mother birthed four children. Her second son took too much of her blood into his heart. When my brother died in her arms, my mother could not heal him. When I was born, two years after, my mother had stopped healing. All her faith clotted inside my lungs. I didn't cry when I was born. My mother held me silent for 30 minutes in her arms. When the nurse tried to pry me away from her, my grandmother's telegram arrived. My mother says I laughed when the nurse tried to take me from her. She birthed two children after failing to heal her second son. My mother was a believer. My grandmother was a healer. My mother's younger sister was a Christian. My mother's other younger sister had a paralyzed daughter. All were wonderfully beautiful. My mother's younger sister's paralyzed daughter died when she was 15. My mother's younger sister visited her on the other side. When her daughter returned after three months inside a mechanical heartbeat, she had three clots of blood down the front of her body, on her chest, in her navel, just above her vagina. She still could not walk. My grandmother was touched by her father's younger brother. My mother was touched by her mother's sister's husband. My mother's younger sister was touched by her mother's sister's husband. My mother's other younger sister was also touched by her mother's uncle. My mother had always wanted a daughter. She never left me alone with any of her sister's husbands. The protection my mother gave me was the Bible, fear, and chastity. We were all afraid of God, men, and the dark.
Tamako. Even pleading with our ancestors, it has become a strain. But we love this man. It is it really our plea to our ancestors to kill this man. But we live our lives in fear. And by the time we bow tonight, more than 10 women, young girls will be raped, violated, by a lover, by an uncle, someone they know. Well, that is bodies under siege. Yahete mo Africa wa mukati, and it has been an honor to be in your midst, to share the sad realities of women of South Africa and around the world. Mr. Concord and Gabindo on the base. Mr. David Clason on the drums. Ms. Puti Suburu on the keys. Fossil Soul, come through. Soetry. Uvangile Gancho, as they come through. We have shared our hearts tonight. We wish that we could be with you in Sweden, but Coco happened, COVID-19. And hopefully the, our, our path will cross again. We never know when. But I would like to say thank you to the Gothenburg Book Festival, the Embassy of Sweden in South Africa, Ramas, the South African State Theatre, the National Arts Council of South Africa, the, Paul Halm, uh, the Alof Palmer Centre, and hear my voice. Just want to say thank you. Check a sister. It might be of importance to them, something that they just want to hear if someone really cares for them. Thank you once again. Bodies under siege. Again. Taz and Tuck. It's early in the morning, sun's out, birds are singing. Peace in the streets, Africa is beautiful. Been up since the crack of dawn, loving life, oh, I'm winning. As Mother Nature sings in her musical. Mr. Postman, Mr. Postman, oh, could you help me get served? Mr. Postman, Mr. Postman, oh, you seem like such a good soul. Why don't you come back a little later, young girl? I'll certainly do you one solid. Oh, thank you.